Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We are working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Citrix Systems, ticker CTXS. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts about the valuation of this company and its business quality. We are using quickfs.net. If you're interested in QuickFS, tell them you came from Trey at DIY Investing and you can find the link in the description below. Now, software is the industry. This has a market cap of $12.9 billion and an enterprise value of $15.4 billion. You can see a little leverage there because they have some excess debt on this business that should lead to a higher return on equity than the return on invested capital. Citrix System has an enterprise software company that's helpful. They provide workspace, app delivery, security, and professional services worldwide. Um, so basically, enterprise and software are the key messages here. Um, those markets tend to be business to business. This beta is astronomically low, 0.03 I have to guess something is wrong with this calculation. I've never seen a beta this low. Typically a beta of one is normal for a company in the S&P 500. The further it is away from the one towards the low end, the less volatility it has. Lower volatility tends to be better and more an indicator of high quality business. Now, what do we see from return on invested capital? You first notice two things here. One, there's only one year of losses in the last 20 years. That's really, really good. Um, my threshold for a high quality company is either 19 or 20 years of profitability out of the last 20 years. So one year of losses means you had 19 years of profitability. That is acceptable. That meets my target range. Now, something that's interesting to me is for the most of the history part from 2002 all the way to 2016, this is generally very, very stable. Um, year to year changes in return on invested capital are relatively low. It's about 1%. Um, but it's usually not big changes. Um, you do see some sort of cycles here, kind of going up from 19.9% in 2002, 15% in 2005, 9% um, in the low of 2009, 13% in 2011, 7% in 2014, up to 14%. So you do have a pretty good range here, kind of hovering in that 10% range. Um, and there is some cyclicality here, but it's not major and the cycles aren't driving you to losses. Now, 2017, you have a loss. One thing we'll investigate is whether this is one time causes that led to this loss or if they're actually profitable on an operating basis. So we'll take a quick look at that later in the episode um, to break that down. But what things interesting is since 2017 and 2018, 19, 22 and 2021, all the numbers have been much better than they were historically. Um, so that can be both a very, very positive thing because it shows a breakaway in the business, very strong improvement. I mean, if you look at this trend from 2014, seven, nine, 14, if you just skip 17, you're now at 20, 32. So massive acceleration in the business. This could be really good news, maybe new business, new growth, something along those lines that's driving exceptional results. Um, but then you do turn down a little bit in 2020 and 2021. Now that it was COVID, so you have to wonder how does that play into it there? Um, but it's just something to be aware of here when we look at this business. Tenure medium returns all look very good. Return on equity, 19%. Return on invested capital, 11%. Anything over 10% meets my hurdle for return on invested capital. 15% return on equity meets my hurdle. Everything's looking good here. Now, high gross profit margins of 84%. That is very common for a software company. So you're seeing those software strong strength and gross profits. It's going to provide you some strength and potential operating leverage because you have such high gross profits. Falling to the free cash flow line could be something you should see over time. You do see some of this kind of growing from 2012, 2014, 15, 13, 10%, growing up to the 23% range in 2018. However, you do get dropped down again by 2021. So again, you need to be a little bit concerned about that number. Um, price to earnings ratio though is where this all falls apart. Um, everything here showing a very high quality company, but the valuation ratio does not match up. PE of 46 is simply too high for most any company, and it'd be different if this was a one-time problem, but you know that it's not a one-time problem because you have a price to book of 19, you have a price to sales of four. These are high numbers for the company, so it's not like this is just one metric that's out of whack. Um, I'd never pay a PE of 46. It's very hard to justify that. You would need revenue growth in the 20% range for a decade um, or more to justify it, and yet you can see the revenue growth is 3.8%. It's basically anemic. You're not growing that fast. You're certainly not growing fast enough to justify a PE of uh, 46. Likewise, assets are growing faster than res revenue, which is growing, which is kind of like a reverse operating leverage. You're going to have worse and worse returns over time when that happens, which is why you can see EPS and free cash flow both growing slower than revenue. So there's a major concern here 
um, that you're paying a massive multiple for a business that's not really growing as much. It doesn't matter how good your returns on invested capital are if you can't actually grow at that rate. So if you have a 10, 15, you know, let's say a 19% return on equity, that means if you could reinvest everything that you have and you can get another 19% on your equity, you could grow really quick. You could get these 10, 11 to 19% returns on your capital. Um, but you're not able to see that because you're only growing at 3.8%. So your reinvestment rate is very, very low. It doesn't matter how high your gross mar margins are. It doesn't matter how high your returns are if you're not able to grow at those rates. So basic consensus, it's overvalued, but high quality so far. If you're enjoying this video, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell in order to get notifications as I upload new videos each and every week as I work through this series. I'm doing every company in the S&P 500. I'm using QuickFS. If you'd like to use this software yourself, you can set up an account. Go to the link, first link in the description where I discuss, send your link to QuickFS. If you sign up, then you can become a member there and get to use the same software to evaluate companies. Now, let's dive on in further of income statement. So, here we have the income statement. Let's see if we can see anything that's off about that 2017 year was the big loss, right? Yeah, 2017 is the big year. Um, that's what we want to find out is what's going on in 2017. And I think it's going to be a difference between income and operating. See, so, yes, you have a big income tax. So this is the big problem here is that that number is not real. Right, so you have a $528 million in income tax that's really distorting this number. Um, first of all, something is really wrong with this math. Um, this should be a positive number based upon what we're seeing here. Um, so something's weird, but regardless, they made a profit in this year, so it's actually 20 straight years of profits even better for the for the benefits of the high quality. Um, for those that don't recall, 2017, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was passed by um, President Trump and the Republicans, and that messed up everyone's financial statements, whether for 2017, 2018, sometimes they're messed up in 2016. But generally for the financial years, 2016, 2017, and 2018, you have to be really worried at looking at financial statements because the tax law change put a bunch of one-time charges that messes people's statements up. Um, not a big deal in terms of actual performance of the business, but it did change the tax structure. Um, Shares outstanding, one thing I like to see is that they're buying back shares. You've basically retired a third of the shares outstanding over the course of a decade. That's actually really good. Um, that's a really good number to hit. It's basically driving a lot of the EPS growth. But what's weird about this, though, is if they bought back a third of their shares outstanding, why is EPS still lower than revenue growth? Something doesn't make sense there to me. Um, balance sheet. Let's see what we can see. So you can see, you know, this software company, there's basically no PP&E here. Um, the growth in assets is basically driven by goodwill. Um, there's not that big of an asset jump in this business. Um, really, the big asset looks like it was in the last year. They made some sort of acquisition because you basically doubled your goodwill um, without even moving the property, plant, and equipment. And that's really driven the lower returns. But it, it, one thing that this does say is that you might have something where, yes, the returns are lower this year, but the earnings might grow a little bit over time and you have some one-time charges. So something to be aware of. Um, you can see this acquisition hitting in 2021, $2 million or $2 billion acquisition, which is a pretty big acquisition for a company this size. Um, and it's playing in, you know, they didn't buy a lot of assets with that. Um, but you can also see this large net issuance of, of common stock. They're buying back stock every year, pretty consistently above the stock-based compensation. Stock-based compensation is really, really high here, $150 million, uh, up to $350 million by the most recent year. But at least you're buying back enough stock so that you're constantly you know, bringing down the share count and that doesn't make a difference. So it, it still looks good from a shareholder perspective. So here's the thing. I think this company is high quality. I think it's really interesting if the price was lower. Um, for me, I don't know how to predict this from what I'm seeing here. So it probably won't hit my watch list, but that's mainly because the revenue growth rate is so low. Like I would be really interested in this company if the price was 15 times earnings, um, which basically re require a price below 40 um, on the stock chart. Um, and so that's possible to get. And then even still, you look at like a normalized earnings figure might be four or five dollars a share. And so if you say it's four dollars a share, that P, they're already at a PE of twenty five. So maybe you only need to go down to um, a price of sixty. A price of sixty could be really interesting. PE of fifteen. But the, even then, your revenue growth rate is just so low. I can't justify buying a lot of companies these days with, with revenue growth rates of four percent. I like to buy companies with revenue growth rates of ten percent plus, but 
if this is the type of company that is in your wheelhouse, then it could be attractive for you if you want more of those like slower compounders that's really high quality, um, but isn't necessarily growing very quickly. I tend to like faster growth, so for me, it's not gonna go on my watch list, but that can make it attractive for certain investors out there that aren't seeking as high of a growth rate as I am. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe, ring the bell, putting up new videos each and every week, talking about stocks, talking about different investments, and if you like this software that I'm using, I recently partnered with QuickFS to um, work for a program there where you can help support me by signing up for QuickFS through my affiliate link, which is in the link below. Um, first, link in the, first link in the description of the video will have that QuickFS referral link for you. You click that and sign up, and then I'll get a cut of your subscription fees. So thank you for listening, and until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.